Okay, are there any questions before I go ahead and get started? Are there any questions again? So hopefully you can see my uh, screen, my computer screen. And uh, if you look on the schedule today, what we're going to be doing is finishing chapter 13. We hopefully will start chapter 7. I don't think we'll finish chapter 7, but hopefully we'll get it started. Uh, there is no lab all week for today. However, on Thursday, if I do not review the material for the final in the lecture on Thursday, I will review it in the lab at 6.30. Any questions about that? Meaning I am planning to give a review for the final. And I hope to give it on Tuesday, which probably will happen. But if I don't succeed on giving on, on Tuesday, I will give it on Thursday in the lab time. In the lab, you should be working on your unknown work. I will show up in the lab at 6.30 to answer questions. But if there are no questions, I will log off at 6.45. And if you haven't looked, I sent out a whole bunch of unknown, what do you call that, test requests. Uh, today, I sort of fell behind on that. I'm sorry about that. Uh, for most people, I was only a day behind. But uh, for one person, I must have missed her. And I really apologize for that. I was almost a week behind on her. And I'm certain I had done that twice. And I don't know how I missed her. Anyways, uh, are there any questions about what we're doing? Remember, there will be a cumulative and comprehensive final. It will cover 50% of the questions uh, of the material since chapter 8. So meaning chapter 14, chapter 13, and chapter 7, as well as lab 9. Is that right? No, it's not Lab 9. Uh, although the lab's material will be on the, the uh, final, but only 10% of the questions come from the lab. 90% uh, do come from the lecture, 90% of the questions. And I know that's not adding up. I'm saying 90% from the lecture, 10% from the lab. And then of the, uh, well, not the lecture part, 50% uh, of the questions will come from the last quiz. All right, let's move forward. Hopefully I haven't confused you. Hmm. So we were talking about coronavirus last time, and I believe I finished this slide. Talking about the symptoms of coronavirus, that the symptoms are similar to the flu. Obviously, lethality is higher than the flu. Um, the incubation period is very similar to the incubation period of the flu. And the prevention, wash your hands, keep your distance from other people. You want to keep six feet from other people. Uh, wear a mask, especially when you're out in public. And uh, do not touch one's face, because if you pick it up on your hands and then you uh, inoculate it in the mucous membranes in your head, you will get it. And of course, if you're sick, don't go out in the public. Don't spread it. This virus spreads way too easily, and it's way too lethal to be spreading it around. Any questions about any of that? All right, so let's change topics. We're done talking about the different viral families. Now let's talk a little bit about viruses and cancer. Some human cancers, uh, it's estimated that about 10 to 15 percent of them are caused by viruses. And let's take that word cause in a broad sense. 
meaning that the, the cancers have some connection with viruses. And it is true that the viruses are probably mutating the cells or causing the cells to lose their growth control, which then gives rise to cancer. Some examples of cancers which are caused by virus are uh, cervical and skin cancer. They're caused by human papillomavirus, if you've ever heard of that. Actually, human papillomavirus is the number one cause of uh, genital warts, so I'm sure you've heard of that one. But there are other human papillomaviruses, uh, like a wart on your finger is a human caused by human papillomavirus, but that wart does not cause cancer, meaning the one that causes warts on your fingers. Uh, hepatitis B virus and hepatitis C virus causing hepatitis can also give rise to liver cancer. And there are numerous other examples. Uh, a common one is, uh, oh, let me see if I can remember the name of that. Uh, a cancer that only FEMA, cervical cancer, also caused by uh, viruses. Not all cancers are caused by virus. Uh, a study by Tang in 2013, I don't know if you want to call that recent or not anymore, showed that breast cancer and glioblastomas, as far as we know, are never caused by a virus. So some cancers arise without a a virus having any role to play in the cancer. Any question about any of that? Uh, let's briefly state what cancers are. Uh, cancers are uncontrolled growth of cells and a cell loses its ability to control its growth. It undergoes transformation, acquires new phenotypes, meaning it keeps on growing and forming a mass, and that we call a tumor. There are different properties that those cells have. I'm not really going to go into that, but uh, when the properties get to be very bad, we don't call it a benign tumor, we call it a cancer. Okay, any question about that? I'm not going to quiz you on cancer, but I did want to mention a little bit what it was. And that viruses can cause cancer. There are two main ways that viruses appear to cause cancer. First, you know about proviruses where the viral DNA integrates into the DNA of our cells. Well, the formation of this provirus causes a per permanent genetic change in the cell. And that can lead to mutations. If you think about it, if you have a gene and then a virus integrates in the middle of that gene, that's going to mutate the gene. Uh, DNA viruses and retrovirus cause cancer in this way, where the DNA integrates into the uh, genome, or a retroviral DNA integrates into the genome. And as far as we know, these viral cancers that integrate into our cells, they just move into the DNA sort of at random. Any question about that? So if it's moving into one cell in one gene, you can mutate that gene, and that can lead to cancer. Uh, with the retroviruses, when somebody gets a retroviral infection, uh, the retroviruses in different cells can integrate in different regions of the DNA. And that, of course, can lead to different cancers in the person, but usually the person uh, just gets one cancer. There is a second way that viruses can ca cause cancer. There are some viruses that we call oncogenic viruses. They contain an oncogene in the genome of the virus. An oncogene is a mutated form of a cellular gene involved in cell growth. And this mutated gene causes the cell to grow 
without control, meaning it keeps on growing and it causes the cell to become tumorous. And that is how oncogenic viruses cause cancer. They're carrying an oncogene with them, and then when they get in a cell, they can cause that cell to become cancerous. Any question about any of that? There aren't too many viruses known in man that carry oncogenes, but human T, T, let's see, human T cell lymphoma virus is an oncogenic virus that causes uh, cancer in humans. Any questions about that? Most of the oncogenic viruses we know grow in animals, but there are a few that we know uh, spread in humans, and I don't know, <laughs> I do not know how human T cell lymphoma spreads. I don't know if it spreads from one patient to another, or patients get it from their mother. I don't know. But I do know it's a virus and it can cause human cancers. Okay. Any question about any of that? All right, let's move on. Uh, we've talked about lytic human viruses, which work the same as lytic uh, bacterial viruses, meaning bacteriophages. And we did mention budding viruses, which we find in animal cells, but we do not find budding viruses in bacterial cells. Well, there are actually a third and a fourth other types of animal viruses, and let's talk about them. There are latent animal viruses, and there are persistent viral infections, which are, or at least can be different, but we're not really going to talk about how they, they grow. Uh, they, they act like a uh, budding virus, except they don't bud out of a cell membrane. And what they do is they get in a, uh, a vesicle, and then the vesicle leaves the cell. And that's how the virus leaves the cell. And they tend to be shed at low numbers. That's why they persist. And like I said, we're, I'm not going to test you on that. I will test you on the latent animal viruses. So let's talk a little bit more about them. The latent animal viruses can cause latent viral infections. And when the virus becomes latent, the virus remains in the patient but the patient is asymptomatic. Their host cells, well, they kind of act like they're not infected, but they are. And sometimes the host cells can be latent where the viral is inactive, for a better word, inactive for long periods of time. And while the virus is latent, it does not cause disease in the patient. The problem is the latent virus can leave latency and then they enter another viral life stage, which is usually the budding life stage where the virus will then start replicating and then bud out of the cell. But uh, a latent virus could be uh, enter the lytic life cycle depending on the species of virus. Uh, most of them that I know that are latent uh, enter the budding life cycle. But they could, if it's a certain species of virus, instead of entering the budding life cycle, enter the lytic life cycle. Any question about that? So the virus, for its own reasons, leaves latency and then enters another viral life stage and the virus becomes active, and while it is active, it can cause disease. Two examples of that is cold sores caused by herpes simplex virus type 1. You know, I should put a type in there. Although, yeah, we'll go type 1. 
Um, when you have a cold sore, the virus is replicating and it is being shed and the virus is active. And this virus sheds by the budding life cycle. Uh, and then it can go latent. The cold sore will go away. The patient isn't shedding viruses. The patient is not contagious. And the virus just stays there until the next time the patient gets a cold sore. And then the virus comes out of latency again. Another example is shingles. The child, usually when they're young, comes down with chickenpox, and the child sheds the virus, and then the chickenpox virus goes latent, usually for decades. And then the virus comes out of latency, and the patient doesn't get chickenpox the second and all other times, they get shingles. And while the shingle sore is there, visible, the patient is shedding virus. It buds out of the cells. And the patient is contagious. But once the sore goes away, I'm not talking about the shingles pain. I'm talking about the visible sore goes away. The virus has once again entered latency. A trigger for uh, latent viruses to come out of latency is usually a stressor. Like with cold sores, the stress is frequently the patient gets sick, comes down with a cold, and then they get a cold sore. Any question about that? That's why it's called the cold sore, by the way. It can be other stresses, like I knew a patient who uh, every time he got a little bit of sunburn in the spring. He didn't ever get sunburn in the winter time, but then he would go out and get a lot of sun, maybe just playing or working out in the yard or something like that. And the first time he got a little too much sun and got sunburn, he would get a cold sore. Okay. And then the stressor usually for shingles is the patient becomes elderly and uh, their immune system becomes weakened and then the shingles pops up. Any question about any of that? Okay, let's talk a little bit about persistent viral infections. These diseases caused by a persistent virus processes over a long period of time. So the patient will get the incubation be incubated with the virus, and then the viral load will slowly increase over time, and the patient will have this virus for a long period of time, and they will be shedding this virus for long periods of time. The viral load, as well as the disease, increases with more time. So detect detectable infectious viruses may build up over a long period of time. And usually with more and more time, the viral load as well as the disease, symptoms and signs will get worse and worse. The virus is never cleared by the host immune system, why it's called the persistent viral infection. It can be fatal. It doesn't always have to be, but it may be fatal. A case of it is subacute Sclerosing, sclerosing pan encephalitis, which I'm sure most of you have never heard of. It's actually caused by the measles virus. And in these patients, instead of getting the measles, and then the measles goes away, and the person is then cured of the measles virus, for some reason the measles just keeps around in the system and builds up to higher and higher and higher levels over time. And it's a long infection, getting worse and worse with time. Another example is that AIDS, where the HIV virus builds up slowly from incubation time and gets worse. 
And then balloons when the patient gets AIDS symptoms. But it never, well, in the old days, it never decreased. And it can be fatal. Okay? Nowadays, they do have medication to keep the AIDS patients alive. And they're being kept alive for decades. But the, the persistent viral infections do not have to be fatal. Many of them are tolerated. It depends on the species, like cytomegalovirus. This species of virus usually does not kill people. And if a person gets it, they frequently will have a persistent viral infection, and then it lasts for a long period of time. And uh, even though it's persistent, in this case, it doesn't get worse with time. It's just the, the, the patient, I don't know, it stabilizes and the, the virus climbs up to a point and then it plateaus. Uh, some patients get chicken pox, which becomes uh, a persistent viral infection. My mother actually got that. Gosh, what was she? Like uh, 88, 89, something like that? Maybe 87? Uh, she got uh, shingles, and it never went away. She had a persistent viral infection of the chicken pox. Uh, very few patients get that. It's less than one in a thousand uh, shingles patients. Get it, and then the shingles never goes away. She said at the end of her life at age 92 that she thought the shingles were getting better, but they never fully went away. So a persistent viral infection. Some other herpes viruses also give a persistent viral infection. When we look at the persistent viral infection, it follows the, uh, the green line here usually, and that is the patient initially gets an inc incubated, and then the viral load increases with time. And this could be many years. And then at one point, the viral infection blooms, the viral load gets much worse, the patient's symptoms get much worse, and a classic point in case is HIV, and at this point the patient becomes an AIDS patient, the symptoms get really bad. And in the old days, the graph is, is broken here because it meant the patient died. And that's the way many persistent viral infections come. Any question about that? Now let's contrast the persistent viral infection with an acute viral infection. Unlike the fact that the, the virus slowly grows up over time, over many years, and then blooms, and then the patient frequently dies. In an acute viral infection, the patient, uh, once uh, incubation period occurs gets a very high viral load and it happens over a short period of time. With the human cold it's something like three days to at maximum uh, 14 days. And then the patient gets the cold and then the virus goes away very quickly and we no longer have the cold. Uh, rarely, very rarely do I have a cold lasting longer than a week? And then it goes away totally. You don't have the virus anymore. Any question about the acute viral infection? Contrasting to the persistent. Let's take a look at a latent viral infection. It's a combination of the acute and, I don't know, maybe a little bit of the persistent. But uh, initially in the the uh, infection, like a child gets chicken pox, shortly after they uh, are incubated, they shed the virus and at large numbers very quickly. And then the virus drops to very low levels. Okay? But the virus doesn't totally disappear. It becomes latent and the virus cannot be found in the patient at least, uh, I'm talking about active viruses circulating in the patient. But the virus 
hides out somewhere in the patient's cells. The virus is not replicating. It's not being shed from the patient. And then at some period later in time, it could be months to years, the virus comes out of latency and the patient has an active viral infection again. And very quickly, once that happens, the virus load increases, never to what it was before, but it becomes high. And then the viral load decreases until the virus goes, well, latent again. You can't detect the virus in the patient. And that's usually the way shingles goes. You have an initial infection, which is called chickenpox, and has different symptoms in shingles. And then for a year, maybe years later, it'll come out and you get another infection that we call shingles, and then it goes away. I knew a person who got the shingles infection about every other year. I'm not sure why, but that just happened to be the way it went with her. She was middle-aged when she was getting this, and obviously she had chicken pox when she was younger. I don't know her at a younger age, but while she was middle-aged, uh, about every other year she would get a shingles infection. So you can have shingles multiple times. Most people don't. In fact, most people who get the chicken pox, they will die before they ever get a shingles case. I think it's only about 15% of the people who get um, chicken pox come down with shingles. But that's because they die before they get the shingles. Okay, any question about the latent virus infection compared to the persistent viral infection and an acute viral infection? If not, let's move on. I guess I should make a question. Are there any question about viruses? Because we're going to move on to another topic. I don't hear anything, so I'm going to move on. Uh, we're going to talk about prions. Prions stand for proteinaceous infectious particle. PR comes from proteinaceous, I from infectious. And uh, I'm not sure where the O comes from. <laughs> and the P, oh, never mind. I don't know where the, the, I guess the N comes from the infectious too. Okay. Uh, anyways, uh, uh, prions are infectious proteins. They are inherited and transmissible between patients by ingestion transplantation and by, um, I guess, transplanting by surgical instruments that have the prions on them. They're a very unusual disease because they're caused by a protein agent, an infectious protein. Any question about that? These are the only diseases which are infectious which are not transmitted by an agent having a genome. A protein, of course, has no genome. Prions cause spongiform encephalopathies. Uh, this is the vacuoles in the brain in humans and other animals. I'll show you a picture of spongiform encephalopathy of the brain in a few slides. Uh, in animals, we usually call them spongiform encephalopathy, like bovine spongiform encephalopathy, but that's the scientific name. Uh, that term is more commonly called mad cow disease. But there are other diseases as well. In sheep, there are scrapies. Scrapies is a disease that sheep ranchers in Europe have been dealing with for centuries, and then cervid, chronic wasting disease. In humans, we don't call it any of these names. We tend to call it uh, after the scientist who found it or after the disease 
in a certain region. Uh, like most cases in humans are called Kreutzfeldt Jakob disease. <coughs> but there are other names. Fatal, familiar, familial insomnia, and Kuru. Fatal and familial insomnia, as the name implies, means it's inherited in the family and they, they get insomnia and then die of it. Uh, Kreutzfeldt Jakob disease, which happens in humans, can be inherited, but only about 50% of the cases are inherited. The other cases happen spontaneously or when the patient consumes prions. And we'll talk briefly about that. Uh, Kuru is another uh, human disease we'll talk about caused by prions. Kuru was a disease seen in the Four tribe in Papua New Guinea, this region here on the map, if you can see that. It was a drastic disease leading to the patients being unable to walk, loss of their ability to swallow or chew, and the patient just wastes away, loss in weight, uh, increasing immobility, and then it leads to death. Uh, how it was transmitted in the four tribe is by consumption of the prions. The four tribe had a, a unique funeral ritual and they apparently cooked and ate their relatives. It was part of their funeral practice. And uh, uh, actually the mothers noticed that the children were getting Kuru and so they stopped feeding their children as well as themselves the, uh, the flesh of their dead relatives. And the missionaries came into the Four Tribe and uh, they really stamped out this practice of eating their dead. Uh, missionaries, I don't remember if that was the 1940s or 50s or maybe even earlier, that was anathema to the missionaries and uh, they really, they really, uh, <laughs> what I say, they really tried to stamp it out because they thought it was a really uh, despicable practice and uh, um, at the time the missionaries came out, only the men were eating the dead anyways, but uh, uh, the missionaries did the four tribe a, a uh, what am I saying, a, uh, a benefit, and that is they get, got rid of Kuru in the, the four tribe, okay? Any question about that? I don't really approve of missionaries changing a culture and uh, bringing their values to another culture. But in this case, I think it did the four uh, culture a, a benefit. Uh, I mentioned that uh, uh, prions causes spongiform encephalopathy in the brains. Here is a picture of a normal brain. And here is a picture of a brain of a patient who has Kuru. And there is a brain, probably of a sheep, that has scrapies. And then this is a brain of a Kreutzfeldt Jakob disease patient. And you can see in all of them that the brain is abnormal. And it sort of looks like a sponge. That's why it's called spongiform encephalopathy. Any questions about any of that? Okay, as I mentioned, prions are proteinaceous, infectious particles. The mechanism of the disease and how the protein replicates is unique. Uh, in a normal cell, there is a normal gene, which we call PRP with a C. Uh, is that a subscript? I forget whatever that is called, <laughs> with a C up there. And it's a normal cell protein that is found 
in cells, the surface of uh, nerve cells. So it's found in the brain as well as in other nerve cells. And it's a normal cell and the cell needs to have it for the cell to function. So it must play some role in nerve cells. Well, the PRP cell, the normal cell protein, does not cause the prion disease. The trouble is, the PRP SC uh, superscript, that's what it's called, superscript, uh, does cause the prion disease. And how this protein replicates is it comes up to the PRP normal cellular protein and gets the protein to change its folding pattern and that changes it to the scrapies form of the protein. So the only difference between this protein, the scrapies protein, and the normal cellular protein is the folding pattern of the protein. It has the same amino acid sequence. Is that clear to everybody? Any questions about that? Now the trouble is the, the cell, the nerve cell or the brain cell says, oops, I don't have enough PRPC normal protein. So the cell transcribes that gene and makes more PRP uh, superscript C protein in the cell. The trouble is this protein can then come up against two of these proteins in the cell. And then it'll be changed into the scrapies protein. And then the cell says, oops, I don't have enough PRP C protein and it makes more. And you can see this can just balloon out of control. So the abnormal scrapies protein accumulates in the brain. It forms plaque and it eventually leads to the death of the neural cell. Any question about prions? All right. If not, let's move on to another topic, plant viruses and viroids. We haven't talked much about plant viruses and this is the only slide I'm going to talk about them because we're interested in viruses that cause animal disease, especially diseases in patients, and plant viruses do not cause diseases in humans. But plant viruses resemble animal viruses in many ways, and they do cause diseases in plants. And there are economically important crops like beans, corn, sugarcane, potatoes, uh, that can come down with plant diseases caused by plant viruses. Because of the tough cell wall that plants have, the plant viruses tend to enter the plant cells through wounds in the plant cell or via a parasite, such as a nematode, a fungus or an insect. And then infected plants can spread the virus in pollen or seeds. Any question about plant viruses? All right, that's all we're going to talk about plant viruses. Let's talk about viroids. Viroids are similar to viruses. They're similar to an RNA virus, that is a naked virus. So all it has is an RNA molecule in the center of the virus and then a protein coat around it. Well, if you remove the protein coat, you have a viroid. A viroid, all it is is a naked RNA molecule 
which is infectious. And then when the cell gets this viroid, it takes in the naked RNA molecule and then replicates it, and it causes disease. Fortunately, there are no viroids that are known in animal cells. All viroids that are known infect plants. So viroids are plant pathogens only, and they cause some important diseases. Uh, the uh, only one that uh, you would need to know about, the only one that you probably maybe even heard of, is that viroids can cause uh, diseases in potato plants, causing the potato to be stunted. So instead of getting a nice big potato from the potato plant, you'll get a stunted potato. All right, any question about plant viruses or viroids? Is the people here? I'm not seeing anyone. If um, yeah, there, you're if there. Sorry. A potato that if a potato has or any plant has one of these um, viroids that just kind of make them smaller, are they transferable to people at all? Can they be toxic to people in any way? Uh, no, the virus or the the viroid. You know. I suppose it's just a messenger RNA, so I can't really say. Uh, I'm not certain that they can't get in the human cells, but they do not cause uh, problems in human cells. And they might not even be able to infect a human cell because all the viroids we know are specifically designed to bind to and infect plant cells. So they do not cause disease in any animal that we know of. Thank you. Okay. But yeah, a patient could eat them. But RNA is uh, highly fragile. So uh, even cooking the potato would kill it. Okay. But it, like I said, it doesn't cause disease in humans. Uh, it's only a problem for potato farmers. And if they have their uh, field contaminated with the viroid, then they should not use the equipment they use in that field in any other uh, potato field or else they could spread it. All right. Uh, let's end this lesson and say that there have been some very large viruses found to infect amoebas. And I don't know what's particular about amoebas, but all of the large viruses found have been infecting uh, amoebas. Megavirus, which I think I've already discussed, it uh, used to be the largest virus known, and it's approaching the size of the smallest prokaryotic cell, okay? Uh, more recently, there's been another large virus found called Pandora virus, and it is actually approaching the size of a, an average prokaryotic cell. That's how large this virus is. Uh, just something to know for trivia, and that is, it used to be that viruses were much smaller than prokaryotic cells. Uh, there are two examples now where that's not the case, where the virus is as large as, or even larger than the smallest prokaryotic cells. All right, any question about viruses or any of this lesson? If no questions, I'm going to move on to our last uh, chapter. Chapter 7.
and hopefully we can finish this today. If not, we'll be very close to finish it, and so uh, I'll get to it. All right. So chapter seven is looking at the control of microbial growth, and that is using things like antiseptics and disinfectants. And there are a few others which we will discuss, but the point of having this chapter last is, is that it's an easier chapter for students to understand because they have some familiarity with this chapter already. Uh, in the first slide, I list out the major goals of this chapter in a rough outline. Know the terms. Some of these we've discussed already. Sterilization, disinfection, antisepsis, degerming, sanitization, autoclaving, pasteurization, biocide, germicide. Be able to discuss the factors that influence microbial death rates. Be able to discuss the three main ways in which antimicrobial agents kill or inhibit cells. Be able to understand the various types of disinfectants and how they work. And understand the relative resistance of the major microbial groups to different antimicrobial agents. And this will be the last topic, or one of the last topics we'll talk about. But the different groups have different resistance to the antimicrobial agents. For example, I mentioned that the mycobacteria have a lot of lipids in their cell wall. And so anything that is water soluble will have a hard time getting through the cell wall of the mycobacterium. Any question about any of that? All right, let's move on. Let's see if I can blow this up a little. Let's put it down there. Uh, the rate of microbial growth, we can look at a population of bacteria cells and treat it to some agent, and we find a constant logarithmic rate of dying when the cells are heated or treated with an antimicrobial chemical, meaning the number of cells on a log scale on the y-axis and the time, and we see a pretty constant die-off where we get 10% of, not 10%, 90% of the population dying at one time unit. And this could be in minutes, but it depends really on the cell and the agent we are. For example, we see this same curve when we expose a population of bacteria cells to bleach and the die-off happens much more than in six minutes uh, uh, with bleach. The die-off would happen, oh, I don't know, 10 to 30 seconds, you get at least a 90% die-off rate and 10 to 30% seconds, uh, 10 to 30 seconds, you get another die-off rate. But the point is, is that with more time, you get more death. And so if you have a very large number of cells, like a million cells, and you first treat it at zero time, there's no deaths. But then after one minute, instead of having a million cells, uh, you only have uh, 10 to the fifth cells, meaning 90% of the population die. And then you go to two minutes, you have 90% of that population dying. And so instead of a million cells, you now have 10 to the fourth. And then for each unit of time, you get another 90% die off. So it drops to 1,000, drops to 100, drops to 10, and then drops to one. And then at this point, usually in the next time lag, it'll drop to zero because when we're talking about one cell, you can't get really less than one cell. It's either one or zero. The cell is either alive or not. Any question about any of that? 
So when you're treating a population, the important thing to come out of here is you need to treat that population for a long enough period of time to get total cell killing. Any question about that? Let me shrink that a little. There we go. So the rate of microbial death is affected by a number of uh, factors. So the effectiveness of an antimicrobial treatment depends on, one, the number of microbes. The more microbes you have at the start, the longer the treatment has to be. You have a lower population starting, and then you don't have to expose the population for as long a time if you have more cells in the population. Uh, let's come back to this one. I'll talk about it. We already talked about the, the number of microbes affect how long you have to do. Obviously, the time of exposure uh, affects the population also. You need a longer time for longer populations, just for more time for more of the population to die. And there's other factors that can affect the time of exposure. For example, if the bacteria species makes endospores, you need to have a longer uh, time of exposure to the treatment than you do if the species does not produce endospores. Does that make sense? Okay. I'm hoping that'll be. Uh, I have a message here. My internet connection is unstable. So if I lose you, I will try and uh, reestablish the link. Yeah, it's kind of jittery a little bit. I don't know what the problem is, but uh, it must be my, uh, what do you call that? The... Uh, Internet service providers having problems. Uh, the microbial characteristics can affect the microbial death rate. Uh, obviously, endospores are one of the microbial characteristics. And I'll discuss more about this at the end of this lecture. But if the cells have different characteristics, they can affect uh, the death rate. And then lastly, environmental influences can affect the microbial death rate. For example, the presence of organic matter around, which you almost always see in hospital specimens, can affect the treatment. Uh, like when you're cleaning up, I don't know, a diarrhea accident in a hospital, the Organic matter around can inactivate the bleach. So you have to use more bleach and expose to a, for a longer period of time to make sure you kill all of the bacteria. So the presence of organic matter can inactivate the treatment. And bleach is one which is highly susceptible to inactivation by organic matter but there are many other treatments which are inactivated by organic matter. The temperature of the treatment can also affect uh, the die-off rate. Generally speaking, the higher the temperature, then the more effective the treatment will be. And that's why we like to wash our clothes and our dishes in warm water. You're more likely to kill off the pathogens with a warmer temperature as well as the soap. And then the presence of biofilms can greatly influence the treatment. Cells that have biofilms are much more resistant to almost every treatment than cells that do not have a biofilm. Any question about any of that?
All right, here's some terminology you should know for controlling microbial growth. I'm just going to say the words and tell you you should know what it is. You do not need to provide an example. Okay, sterilization. This is the destruction, removal of all forms of microbial life, including endospores. Prions may not be killed by sterilization. Let me blow this up a little, so that's a little easier to see. Uh, in the lab, if you get media, we usually sterilize your media uh, by autoclaving. Commercial sterilization is another term that doesn't mean anything like sterilization. This is sufficient heat treatment to kill endospores of Clostridium botulinum in canned food. So commercial sterilization is something that businesses do to sell their products. Disinfection is the destruction of vegetative pathogens on an object, like when we disinfect the toilet. Disinfection may not kill um, endospores. Antisepsis is similar. It's the destruction of vegetative pathogens on living tissue. The difference is an antiseptic is usually less harsh than a disinfectant because we don't want to destroy the flesh that we apply the antiseptic to. Uh, a good example of a, a non-harsh antiseptic is tincture of iodine. You can swab it on the patient's skin and it can stay there for, I don't know, days, and it doesn't cause any problem to the patient. But it does cause problem to vegetative pathogens. Once again, disinfection and antisepsis does not kill endospores. Degerming is simply the removal of microbes from a limited area, such as when you alcohol swab the skin before giving an injection. You do not sterilize the skin, and you would not want to sterilize the skin because if you use a sterilizing agent on the skin, you would kill the skin cells. Degerming just removes the bacteria, bringing it to, quote, safe, unquote, levels. Any question about that? Sanitization. The treatment which is intended to m lower microbial counts on eating and drinking utensils, and that's just to bring them to safe public health levels. So hopefully when you're eating out, you've been getting sanitized dishes, okay? Yeah, sanitization should destroy COVID-19, just in case anyone was interested. Uh, a biocide or a germicide is a substance that kills germs, meaning uh, uh, microbes. Biocides and germicides do not usually kill endospores. They just kill the vegetative cells. A bactericide is an agent which kills bacteria cells. A fungicide, an agent which kills fungus. A viricide, an agent which inactivates viruses. And if you don't know about COVID-19, a very effective viricide is to expose something that you want to remove viruses from to sunlight. In the summertime, you'd only need about 15 minutes exposure to sunlight to kill uh, the viruses, or I should say to inactivate the viruses. In the wintertime, I'm not sure how long you need, and it is longer in the wintertime. Oops, sorry, shouldn't have done that. Uh, bacteriostasis, this is inhibiting the growth of microbes. It does not 
kill the microbes. So a bacteriostatic antibiotic only inhibits the growth of the microbes. Once you remove the bacteriostatic agent, growth might resume. Uh, with bacteriostatic uh, antibiotics, the hope is that the host immune system can rid the body of the bacteria. Any question about any of that? Sepsis refers to microbial contamination, like sepsis of the blood, microbial contamination in the blood, but you could have sepsis, I know, of your media in a flask, for example. Uh, asepsis is the absence of contamination by unwanted organisms. Aseptic techniques are important in surgery to minimize the contamination from the surgical procedure. If you don't know, in the old days, before they practiced aseptic surgery, the majority of the patients did not die from the surgery or the wound. They died from infection that the surgery caused, meaning the surgery went fine, just that the wound became infected from usually the surgery or maybe from afterwards, and then the patient died of the secondary infection. Why we practice aseptic surgery today. Uh, antimicrobial agents kill or inhibit by three mechanisms. They can alter membrane permeability, they can damage intracellular proteins, or they can damage nucleic acid. These are the three ways that antimicrobial agents kill or inhibit cells. Alteration of the membrane permeability, they do damage to the plasma membrane, lipid, or maybe to the proteins in the plasma membrane or maybe they just put a hole in the plasma membrane. This causes cellular contents to escape from the cell, interferes with normal metabolism, and the cell dies. Uh, let me think if I can remember it. Polymyxin B is an antibiotic which damages the cell membrane. And that's why that is an antimicrobial agent. Uh, other antimicrobial agents can damage intracellular proteins. If you denature proteins, particularly enzymes, or target the disulfide bridges, or just denature the proteins, you can kill the cell. For example, if the cell cannot metabolize the nutrients that it needs, that cell is going to die. And alcohol, this is one way that alcohol kills cells, by denaturing proteins. You can also uh, kill cells by damaging their nucleic acid. It, that will result in mutations, and you get enough of them that will result in cell death. Any question about any of that? Uh, an example of uh, uh, damage to nucleic acids, uh, UV light kills bacteria as well as our cells by uh, damaging the nucleic acid. It creates thymine dimers between two adjacent thymines, meaning if you have I don't know, A, T, G, C, T. They're not adjacent. It'd have to be something like A, T, T. The two thymines have to be next to each other. And then the two thymines covalently bond two times. And when they do that, they cannot bind to the, um, the adenine on the second strand of DNA. 
and so there's no hydrogen bonds in that region. And that uh, mutates the cell, you get enough of them in the cell that will kill the cell. Why you shouldn't expose your skin to sunlight for too long and get sunburn. There are various physical methods which can be used to control microbial growth. This table is listing some of them. Heat, filtration, low temperature, which that may not kill the cells. It may just prevent them from growing. Uh, high pressure, desiccation, osmotic pressure, and radiation. All of these are physical methods we use to control microbial growth. Heat. All methods of heating kills microorganisms by denaturing proteins and enzymes. Though if you have enough heat, such as flaming or incineration, you literally turn the cells into char. The carbon in the backbone of whatever molecule it is is converted to charcoal and that will kill the cells just as well as denaturing the proteins. A wet heat is more efficient at killing microbes than dry heat. And how you can tell that wet heat is more efficient, when you have boiling water, you don't want to stick your hand through the steam, because that will burn you in less than a second. And autoclaving and steaming treatment are treatment using wet heat. Compare that to dry heat. I'm sure most of you have stuck your hands in an oven, which is much higher than 212 degrees Fahrenheit. And while you're taking the cake or the bread or whatever you're cooking out of the oven, it doesn't burn you. Dry heat, even at a higher temperature, is not as efficient as wet heat at killing. To kill, using dry heat, like baking something, you have to expose it to much longer temperature than you do with wet heat. A wet heat, when they steam, they just usually steam the surface of something, and, and that uh, is the treatment, and then they move on, meaning the steam exposure is not very long, maybe a second or less, and then boiling, another example of wet heat. You just need to usually bring it to a boil and that uh, kills the microbes and then you can serve it. Whereas baking, to kill the microbes you have to bake it for an hour or two at a much higher temperature, something like 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Flaming and incineration also kill cells and this is such a high temperature that you need a brief exposure for flaming incineration to, uh, to work. But that's because the, the carbon in the cell is becoming char. And uh, so that's why you need less exposure to this type of dry heat. But this is very high temperature. That's not a temperature you bake at. Uh, moist heat denatures, coagulates proteins and enzymes. An example of most heat denaturation is when you take a liquid uncooked egg and then you cook it. Uh, please understand that boiling only kills bacterial pathogens, most viruses, fungi, fungal spores. To get all of them you should boil for 10 minutes, but often it's much faster. Like you put E. coli in boiling water, it's dead. You only need exposure for, I don't know, a couple of seconds, and over 90% of the cells will be dead in, nine, uh, in just a couple of seconds. Um, to get total killing, you would need more than a couple of seconds. I don't know what it would be for E. coli, but you do need longer than just a couple of seconds. The point is, is that boiling does not kill endospores, does not kill some viruses. 
Some can survive greater than 20 hours in boiling water. We're talking about endospores. And then this does not kill prions, but prions are very hard to kill. And kill is not quite the right word. We should say inactivate the prion. So reliable sterilization, how do we do that? Using moist heat. We elevate the temperature from boiling and we use pressure. And that is called autoclaving. Uh, autoclaving, it's similar to using a pressure cooker, if you know what that is. You're using both pressure and uh, elevated temperature. We're using 121 degrees Celsius, and somebody will have to look up what that is in Fahrenheit. I know it's over. Uh, 212 degrees, but beyond that, I don't know what it is, Fahrenheit. Uh, and then the pressure, 15 pounds per square inch. And then that will kill everything within 15 minutes of exposure. Okay. Any questions about any of that? I got a question. Yeah. I grew up thinking, well, my culture always boiled, in, you know, the water for a certain system. So what it does, I mean, if it doesn't kill the, the microbes, what it does, it make them multiply? Is that what I mean? Uh, yeah, it would not kill endospores. But if you were to cook something for 10 minutes, you would kill all vegetative pathogens. Okay. And uh, killing endospores would be really, really difficult. There's no way to kill it in food that I'm aware of. Well, I guess you could irradiate it with a massive dose, but there's no, well, easy way to kill endospores. Okay, that's why C. diff infection in the hospital is so difficult to get rid of. And usually what they do is they treat the patient with antibiotics and it kills off the vegetative pathogens, but not the endospores. And then they let the patient be normal for a few days. The C. diff comes back, but the cells that were in endospores have now germinated. And so they're vegetative. And then if you treat with antibiotics a second time, you can get rid of C. diff. And that's, uh, that's the shorthand name. I think it's C. difficile or C. difficile yeah, C. difficile uh, Pasteurization is the reducing the number of spoilage organisms in something that's been pasteurized. It kills the pathogens, but not all microbes in the unit are killed. So it's mild heating, sufficient to kill the spoilage organisms, but the food is not sterile. The thermoduric organisms, those are the heat resistant organisms, can survive and then later cause food spoilage, but these organisms usually do not cause human disease, other than food poisoning because you ate something that the bacteria spoiled the food to, meaning it doesn't get in you and then cause disease. Uh, there's two treatments for getting pasteurized milk. You can expose milk to 63 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes. You can also expose it to 72 degrees Celsius for 15 seconds. Most milk that is pasteurized uses the second treatment. And I think it's just easier for the people who are making the milk and that's why it's done that way. Uh, there is another treatment you can use on milk but it's not pasteurization. Pasteurized milk does have a shelf life and it lasts for about two weeks after you buy it and then after that time you should throw it away because there are bacteria alive in the milk. There are just not uh, human pathogens in the milk. 
but if you have ultra high temperature uh, sterilization of the milk, ultra high temperature treated milk, that's at 140 degrees Celsius for about one second, this milk, if it's closed, does not require refrigeration until you open it. And it can sit on the shelf at room temperature for six months or longer because there's no microbes in the milk. Okay? So it's not pasteurized milk. All right, let's get on to the last slide. We're looking at dry heat here. And this picture is supposed to show you that dry heat does not kill microbes because this cat climbed into the oven because it liked a warm location. Okay? Uh, dry heat kills by oxidation. Two examples, flaming and incineration, but also baking. You need to place something in the oven uh, at 170 degrees, I think that's about 350 or maybe 300 degrees for two hours before you can get rid of the microbes. All right, any questions? If not, I'll continue from here in our next lesson and we will finish this lesson next time. If you have questions for the lab, I'll be there from 6.30, but make sure you log in by 6.45. All right, I'll see you later.